Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to give you an introduction to Celestial Navigation using Microsoft Flight Simulator. Now we won't see any action in the simulator in this video, I'm going to see that for the following video because it's kind of important that you get some of the, I like to call it the crunchy theoretical stuff out of the way before we even dare to do this inside of the simulator. So what are you going to need to get in order to make this possible? Well the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to head over here, this is Flight Sim 2, and you want to grab the cell nav for MSFS, the Celestial Navigation Sextant. This is wild and it's a really 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 neat tool, it works really really well. Um, a lot of people will say, well, do I actually get to look through the site? No. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to get something that looks a little bit like this, which ironically is exactly what you need in order to safely use this product. And like I said, totally free, totally awesome. This is all we need. So afterwards, uh, you're going to need that. Uh, the next thing you're going to need is something to plot your uh, celestial navigation on. Uh, for me, I recommend Little Nav Map. A Little Nav Map looks a little bit like this uh, for the users who have not played with it. I have a very, very detailed video on this that kind of breaks it all down into individual components. The important thing with Little Nav Map is you have to be kind of comfortable doing drawings. So for example, if I hold shift and left click, that's going to give me range rings. If I hold control and right click, it's going to give me one of these lines. You also want to be very, very careful with creating user points. So when you create your artificial positions or your assume positions, really, well, it could be artificial, I don't know. You're able to do that quickly because uh, when you're doing all the math and you're actually in the simulator at the same time, everything is very overwhelming very, very quickly. So like I said, you want to be familiar with this tool and comfortable with it before that. Also, when you're using this tool, make sure you disable the airplane to make it a little bit tougher. You can get a little nav map from this great little website here. Again, I'll have links down in the comments in case you need it. This is amazing. It's free. And honestly, this guy needs a gold star. It's incredible what he did here. Next thing we're going to need is this thing called an almanac. And uh, by almanac, we're referring to nothing none other than a nautical almanac. And uh, this is basically a tool that enables us to identify where the different bodies are in the sky. For example, the sun, you know, Beetlejuice, you know, the moon, any of those items. We need to know where they're supposed to be so we can measure exactly what we need to calculate off of them. When you're using the nautical almanacs, a uh, little heads up for what we're doing to keep it super basic, we're going to be using the sun only for the purpose of uh, site selections here, and you have all these different years, you've got to absolutely 100% make sure that you pick the correct year, the per correct date, and everything is in UTC. Otherwise, you're going to make yourself uh, quite insane. We'll take a look at one of these nautical almanacs a little later. For now, I'm just going to grab the 2022 because that's what year it is, the compact version. I'll go ahead and click on that. I will talk about what all the scary stuff is a little later. It's actually not as bad as it looks. And then the last tool I have is you need something to reduce the site. Now, the reduction of the site is uh, it's an interesting little step that you get kind of towards the end here. The nice thing about this little website, this is totally free, is it will do all the scary math for you. I mean, you can spend more time goofing around on the plane or, you know, getting ready for your next calculation rather than sitting there and basically crunching out all the individual charts. You know, people get a little intimidated with Celestial Navigation because of the amount of the math involved. And if you take a look at this, for example, you can see that there can be a significant amount of math involved. I say, don't worry about it because you're not going to need it for what we're going to be doing. If you want to go into it, and we will in a future video, knock yourselves out. So how does Celestial Navigation work? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at a really basic example. Let's say I have my little room, the room that you know, you're sitting in right now. And let's say we have ourselves a little tiny light bulb up on the ceiling. You know, this is uh, your little overhead lamp kind of a thing. The way Celestial Navigation works is pretty straightforward. What we do is uh, we simply figure out where it is something is, and then we calculate where it actually is and compare that to where we want to be. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say, for example, I'm an observer and I look up at my little lamp up on the ceiling here. I can get myself an angle from that particular thing. I'm not going to make this up. I'll just call it 30 degrees. I know it's not 30. It's a little less than that. Now, let's say that when I look up with a special instrument, I look at the ceiling and it says that the actual angle is 29 degrees, which would mean where I expect it to be minus what it actually is would be a total of one degree. Of course, if you had a one degree error when you're doing actual celestial navigation, time to start over. <laughs> That's a pretty bad error. So that would mean that I'm physically a little bit farther away than I expected myself to be. So you say, well, wait a minute. So as long as I know what the magical angle is at any time and I'm able to compute what it should be, I can figure out where I am. Yeah, you're right, except it gets a little more complicated than that. Remember, you're working in three dimensions. So if you look at an overhead view, and this is my little lamp here, and this is us, um, we can measure this angle, sure. But unless we have another reference point, the only thing we know is that we're somewhere on an imaginary circle around that object where the angle would measure directly to whatever we got it attached to. So unless we have another number, we're missing a critical angle to be able to identify our current position. The way we do that is we can calculate what the azimuth to this particular point is. So for example, if I know that I am at, again, we'll pick 45, it's just an example here. If I know that I'm 45 degrees off of this 
and then I'm at a 30 degree angle, I now have a simple geometry problem. I know you're looking at me going, sure, that's geometry. I'm pretty sure that's trigonometry. No, you're right. It is trigonometry. And we have an interesting trigonometry problem to solve, which is what this does for us. So we don't have to worry about it. Now, theoretically, if we know the distance and we know that angle, or if we know that we're on a specific latitude, we know exactly where we are just because we can do this. Another way to think about it too is if we take the globe here, this is, uh, again, you're dealing with some uh, really, really nice MS Paint art here. And we know the sun is, let's say, right here. Again, this is our sun. This is all completely relative. And we know that the sun is going to travel basically, and if we were perfectly still, the sun basically travels in an arc that looks like this, because remember the earth rotates, not the other way around. Now let's say we are right here. So if we were to look up at the sun, let's say that we um, the sun has an impact of this particular distance right here. If we looked up at the sun, we would know its angle in the sky. Again, we can measure that off of the, you know, the horizon if we were on a boat or something like that. Let's say we measure it and it's uh, 22 degrees. That means we're anywhere on this big circle where looking up at the sun would give us an angle of 22 degrees. But if we know roughly what the, the angle to the sun is, and as far as like northeast, southwest kind of a thing, that's why we do what they call assumed position, we now know exactly where, which one of these positions around that particular there's some we have. It actually gets even better than that. I love the sound effects this makes. I don't know why. Watch this. Bunk. <laughs> It actually gets even better than that. If we measure something like the sun and we get ourselves some kind of angle as well as a height, and let's say we measure the moon and we get ourselves kind of an angle and a height, and let's say we go ahead and have one really, really bright object in the sky like Venus or something like that, and we go ahead and measure that too and we get ourselves you know, a height and an angle, we can now estimate our position anywhere in existence by triangulating the position of those three measurements. So that is all there is to celestial navigation. It's really not that complicated. In our next video, we're actually going to take a look at how we do this Microsoft Flight Simulator. And later on, we're going to show you how to do three points, especially at night where things get a little more complicated. But in the meantime, grab yourself a copy of this. This is, there's no install here. Uh, make sure you have something to plot with. Grab yourself an Alma, nautical almanac and go ahead and grab yourself this really, really great website. And then next time, we'll actually do the math.